Thank you very, very much. So, so what you have really very, um, very um, nicely presented is the uh, the value of the rangelands to the herders and pastoralists, how they utilize it, uh, what tremendous uh, distances also they they move um, day by day uh, in order to find the best places uh, for their animals, and very impressively, Hussein, also in the second part that you showed the. Uh, the interests coming in from large um, players, national or international players, that are basically not recognizing the, the cultural value and the real value um, of these lands to the uh, pastoralists. Which reminds me very much of what happened decades ago with the colonialists that actually basically came into the country and said, oh, this is barren, this is not ours. Uh, and it seems, sadly, that times have not really changed very much. And, and and even within the national governments, the same mistakes are being made that, that used to be made by the foreigners before. Um, I'm sure that there are lots of questions uh, and people wanting also maybe to chip in from their own experiences. So I would like to open the floor. Uh, who would like to have the first comment, question, uh, additional uh, anecdote maybe to share? <laughs> Johannes Schuler, please. Johannes. Yeah. Hello. I'm a partner in the Collins project. Johannes Schuler from Zalf Münchenberg. Thanks for the nice presentation. Um, maybe I missed it, but is there a chance of coexistence? Because um, it might be tough to fight now against these wind parks since they're already there. But is there now a way, once the value is approved, that uh, this can still be used as rangelands or is this basically lost for? for pastoralists. Yeah. I don't know I, who, I do, who wants to I, answer. I will just collect a couple of, because we have several hands up, I will just collect okay. a couple of questions and then say and Brigitte can take uh, the answers. Um, Christian, you're next, and then Michael, and then we'll uh, allow the answers from our two speakers. Christian Bateki, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Christian Bateki with the Declare. Um, Thank you for, for the very nice um, presentation. I have two questions. So the first one is with respect to the app that you are developing. So I have previously done a bit of work also in that direction, but more from the nutritional point. And so I was wondering um, what the new app brings compared to what are existing. So for example, there's the Afri Scout, um, which is also doing at least from what I understood, what you what you want to do. So maybe you could share what you think it could add. If not, maybe is cooperating with such an existing platform already an option for you? That's my first question. And then the second question is one which I, I don't know whether you have an answer, but um, I, I'm always thinking about how to sustain the app once the project runs out. So... Is there a business model that you have in mind or how do you plan to do it? Because I'm facing the same dilemma now in 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 within some other project that um, I'm working on, how to actually sustain the, the application and all that comes with it after the project runs out. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Michael, your quick question. Try to keep the questions short um, so that we can get... Okay, up. Two uh, questions. The first one is um, about uh, the uh, the cultural heritage, um, and uh, Hussein, you said that it is mostly from uh, coming from Europe. That they are not uh, Europe is, or the colonial uh, laws are not acknowledging um, communal lands. But there are some countries in in Europe which have a very strong communal uh, law and and. Um, and heritage and, um, and experiences. My question is, uh, for example, Scotland or UK. Uh, my question would be, be then, can you also be inspired by some of these laws uh, for your own ones? Your own one is very young. We have some some laws which are uh, hundreds of years old on communal lands. Maybe that there, there could be an ex exchange. I, don't, I think it's not enough to only blame the colonists. That you have to or maybe also <laughs> to think or well, look into what uh, they have uh, um, as a as, the, in, as their own uh, contribution, even if they have not imported it to Kenya at that time, maybe now it is the time. Second question, uh, this uh, app that you are developing, um, 
can you imagine that that also cre uh, creates a new run on the resources? If you improve the efficiency of that use and you uh, share that information widely, um, I could imagine that then also uh, the marginal use of these resources will even increase. And so the, 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 the pressure on that resources could in the end even uh, be higher than now because now with an inefficient system of uh, information that is also a certain protection of uh, of the resources uh, against an efficient one just a thought thank you thank you very much so we'll just keep it at these questions for the time being theodora i, I notice your hand you, you'll come in the second round so basically just to sum up for you we have a couple of questions on the uh, the app the benefits of it, the sustainability of the app, and whether it may actually have uh, negative effects. Um, we have a question on the possibility of coexistence of herders plus the, the companies, the wind park companies. And we had a question on the uh, cultural heritage of communal laws, uh, whether you looked into the possibilities of importing some of those. Over to you both. Who wants to start? Brigitte, Hussein? <laughs> I don't know, Brigitte, can I start with the first question by Johannes and then um, go? go yeah. Thank you, Johannes. I think that is a very important observation. And it's actually uh, one of the points actually to argue for even this um, energy investment in the sense that this, this, of course, new land use comes in, as I've said, with quite a good potential in terms of bringing uh, all these you know, economic benefits. But... Uh, what we see is that um, the way it is being implemented is quite top down. And the element that now uh, needs to come in is can the values this community associated with this land be recognized and be respected? Currently, what they do is the investors get their titles from Nairobi without coming down to the communities. And the communities are just told these are investors and they'll bring all this good stuff. But actually, what we have seen is coexistence is the way to go such that once the value of the land from the pastoral perspective is, is understood, then the investment respects that. We have seen some good examples, actually, in other developed countries, in Australia, I think even in the US, when solar panels are, for example, erected, they raise it higher such that animals can graze, they can rest under uh, these solar panels. And this actually increases the economic value of this land because it has now more than one use. So the co coexistence is an important element that needs to be uh, included in this project. So maybe Brigitte, you can take the one on the app. I can also come in briefly maybe with um, this a question by Michael around, um, yeah, it creates, of course, <laughs> maybe more even use of the land, yeah. <laughs> Atrax, yeah. Okay, then let me uh, continue with the app. And um, yeah, Christian, thank you very much for this question. The, indeed, we have included in the project, and that has been actually done mainly by our postdoc, Lily Scheiterle, together with the PhD students to screen all possible available apps internationally in the countries and so on. And interestingly, the only app that has similar features or is also something we can learn from is AfriScout, the one that you have been mentioning. And we are in close contact with the developing team from AfriScout also. But on the other hand, we have our criticism on, uh, and therefore the need what we want to do differently. There is the main um, reason is actually that now, when we are starting to develop the feature, we are including the pastoral list from the beginning, step by step. So that really the way what they need and what they see and what they want and what they fear is uh, included into the features of the app. So that I think is a particular difference. And then our other main critic, and we have also discussed this with AfriScout people, is that they, in order to show availability of pasture resources, they use the NDVI um, maps. And that, of course, in a pastoral area, as I explained, is really of very limited uh, use. 
yeah and so there are more things to be done in our app there is also a feature which helps to connect pastoralists to livestock services which is also something that up to now is not available there are some apps used by livestock services on themselves to or have an overview on disease outbreaks but not uh, not something used that really secures a uh, better service provision to pastoralists themselves. I think that um, is one thing, but um, indeed, um, now at the moment, we have said we can't cooperate with Afriscout because uh, they are a huge project and we are somehow small and then trying to do things also differently. But indeed, also as one option to sustain the app, we are actually thinking about whether this could be possible that later our findings uh, can be used also. That's the way how we want to go. And members from Afriscout are also in our technical working group um, that are accompanying the project. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Are you? Yeah, I think just to add on that, uh, particularly the second part of the question by um, Michael, that it can create maybe a new run for the resources. Actually, uh, when we, in our initial conversations with the community, these are some of the things that they also brought up. Um, but on the flip side, then when you ask them, yes, your resources will be known, but would you like to know resources that you cannot effectively scout and, you know, see? What about these further away areas? They say, yes, that, that would be important for us. So there's need to negotiate on this and see what is it that they are comfortable with to be displayed and what is not. But on the other side, uh, there's this governance that is already in place, you know, the institutional governance that nobody just comes in into another person's area without negotiating, without informing, you know, the elders or so. And as part of our work also, we are already looking at, you know, what governance levels are there, how do they interact how does negotiation for these resources take place? So the app definitely will be backed up by these um, resource governance systems to avoid uh, that kind of uh, rush that happens. Actually, that rush actually even currently happens. People here, you know, sort of, oh, it has rent that side. And sometimes they come in and it becomes disastrous because you come and you find that everything is already uh, exhausted and you already have these animals on the ground. So when you know, um, you know, even how much this result can last, then the governance can advise and say, please don't come in. It's already, it's not enough for us. And the element around, of course, cultural heritage, <laughs> maybe the pity is that uh, the colonialists brought with them what they, what was at an advantage for them. They didn't bring things that were at the advantage of the local communities. But uh, it's through the realization, of course, of now the importance of this heritage, that the law that I mentioned, for example, that Community Land Act has been brought into place. And there are other acts as well also. Issues around recognitions of, you know, communities' knowledge, um, you know, and issues around benefit sharing. All these things are other aspects of, I think, what have, what is um, within that cultural heritage that is also being borrowed and uh, domesticated um, in our countries. Of course, implementation of it is another story anyway. So <laughs> I think I will, I don't know if there's any other bit that we haven't answered. And the coexistence. I know you answered this. Yeah. I mentioned, yeah, I, I, I answered the question. So answer. Yes. Answer. Cool. Thanks very much. First round of questions. Now we have an opportunity for a second round. Theodore, thank you very much for your patience. So please go ahead with your question. And okay. anybody else can already raise their hands if you want to. Can I start? No, Theodore, please go ahead. Thank you very oh. much for the wonderful presentation and letting us um, know about um, the work of InfoRange. I have two quick questions. Um, the first one has to do with the mapping, whether um, you also did map um, dangerous or deadly plants that are not good for the animals and also did um, some kind of um, lab analysis to know the nutritional value of the herbs that the animals have been grazing on or not. And um, the second one has to do with um, how you are engaging the different stakeholders, whether individually in a workshop or um, 
through some kind of theory of change exercise together with all the, the different stakeholders. And um, in terms of the government, are you dealing with the local government together with the national? Um, also, are you including the investors as well in this kind of engagement? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Theodora. I have Raphael here. Welcome. You are you're muted. Can you unmute yes. yourself? Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I've unmuted. Yeah. Okay. First, yeah, I want to apologize for joining late. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hussein and Professor Brigitte, for raising those issues around the land in the pastoralist areas. Uh, I assume the examples that you have given are based on the experiences from our current project location. But my observation is that, that uh, these issues are cutting across the different pastoralist areas, including even areas like Karamoja, where I'm working in. So this, in my view, could call for a collective action around the different uh, pastoralist communities. I know for now uh, there is a limitation because, okay, partly because of uh, uh, the geographical coverage of the project. But is it something that we can uh, give some thought about in the near future? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that suggestion. Uh, Tina also had her hand up in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, a quick one. Uh, thanks, really. Um, a lot of was really an exciting presentation. I learned a lot about the importance of rangelands. Mm -hmm. And into this regard, also my question um, concerning the app: um, Could you have you consider co um, collecting additional data, maybe that you can use um, in in dialogues with the governments and elsewhere? Yeah, if you have the data to enhance the visibility and importance of the rangelands, for example, like um, an additional common field where people could add, we would need a water hole here or maybe a school there, or here here we face a roadblock that is not good, or we have here um, land conflicts so that you, you know, beyond like only moving herds, you could use it really to, to have data to influence government decisions on better rangeland management. Have you contemplated on that? Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just take Tan also um, as the last one in this round because I'm also keeping an eye on the time. So Tan, please come with your question and then Brigitte and Hussein have a chance to respond to all of these questions. Yeah. Thank you very much as well for my side for a really great presentation. I came back also the same with Theodore about the mapping because you also do the mapping with the um, herder and also with the goat map tracking. So I would like to ask how representative of the tracking if you are do tracking the animals, because you know, they have many herbs and they go different directions. Mm -hmm. So how many tracking have you done and it will represent for the whole population of pastoralism? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So we've got a, a, a bundle of different questions. So on the mapping, both of the, the tracking also um, of the, uh, the, the movements of the herds, as well as the mapping of potentially dangerous plants uh, and the lab analysis of the, uh, of the nutritional content. Um, we have a question on whom you actually uh, uh, invited, whether you carried out a theory of change. I noticed Tirol is now very much into theories of change. Uh, I, I heard Peter laughing behind me. <laughs> the theories of change is the, the word of the month. Um, we had the suggestion by, by Rafael Arazio on, uh, on having a concerted action or collective action on land government issues. Uh, and Tina's suggestion to uh, or question whether the app can also be used to influence government decisions on potential infrastructure development in the areas. Over to you two. Okay, maybe I start, yeah? And I like to start about the mapping, also the first question, um, the poisonous plants and nutritional analysis. 
So one thing that needs to be understood is not we do the mapping. We are not doing the mapping. We are facilitating a mapping by the pastoralist, where they, they indicate the features that are of importance to them. So when they want to indicate that in this and that area there is a high presence of poisonous plants, they do so. Yeah? And if in another area there is a particular fodder plant that can only be found in that place, they do so. So it's not our interest that guide that mapping, but the mapping shows what is in their head. Yeah? And uh, then you can uh, show it in its spatial distribution. Um, with regard to, to the nutritional analysis, uh, that's interest, uh, pointing to something that we have come across. And that is that uh, pastoralists, when they are evaluating the pasture areas, the first thing they look at is how animals perform. Yeah? So based on the milk yield or whether they gain uh, weight, they are uh, evaluating the quality of the pasture area. Now they have discovered that in some areas, although apparently the grass and the vegetation is good, the animals are not performing as well than in other areas where they have the impression there is the same amount of fodder. And this is what they have been then uh, putting forward to us as questions and said, look, this would really be of interest to us. And so we, what we want to do is based on their guidance to say, okay, you go and sample here at that time and then you sample here at that time and tell us what is the difference in the nutritional composition. Maybe this explains to us why the animals perform better in one area than another or whether these are other factors. Because pastoralists, when they, um, they have a different system that is completely not understood by scientists, um, to say these are hot and cold areas and these hot and cold has nothing to do with temperature as such. So um, one which influences how animals thrive in particular areas. And I'm pretty sure there is something behind that, but the factors that contribute to them are not, um, not yet known. And I have come across this in my own studies and we come across it again, so maybe sometime we also find out what is behind it. Yeah, that's the question about the mapping. And um, now maybe, Hussein, you want to continue with another question? Just on the second part of uh, Theodore's question on issues around the different stakeholders, you know, to involve them. Uh, what we have, of course, we are, at the start of this project, uh, but where we have started from is understanding uh, the institutional landscape and who is involved in what. So we did what we call net mapping, just to get to understand who has a role in what element of rangeland governance. And this gives us an understanding from, you know, the community level, the different aspects at the governance level, both we have county and national governments. Uh, so this map brings out that. And then once the role is identified then, we do follow up um, conversations with them. Um, the elements around investors, investors are very elusive people. They, <laughs> they just appear when they have interest. <laughs> so it's difficult to know who is an investor uh, at this particular phase, but it's good that also the investors as they come in, uh, get this understanding uh, when uh, talking to the community. And I would like to link that maybe also to the question by Tina on this um, you know, collection of additional data for dialogue already. Uh, with this understanding of the governance and the different levels, we engage in different forums. At the local level, we have community meetings, and then at also um, the governance level, we have um, what we call uh, technical working groups, you know, from different sectors, like in water, you know, in rangeland governance, to inform them about what we found out and the implications for this, you know, in planning, uh, resource governance, new water development aspects, and we do also have a multi-stakeholder forum that brings people from different aspects, other non-governmental organizations in the area. Other, and this is where investors can also come in when they are um, in the area to have this broader conversation. And maybe to cap it up with, uh, sorry, Brigitte, I mean, you might have wanted to talk to this, but with Raphael, 
Uh, it's an interesting question, and that is actually a weak link within um, our own communities. In, in Marsabit, of course, as you understand, um, Raphael, we have 14 ethnic communities. Even having them organized to speak in one voice is such a huge responsibility. But speaking at that level that you talk about, it's quite important, especially to influence, you know, the governor, government at um, at, at that high level, because a lot of things happen at that at that high level. And it's good for us to touch base, converse about what networks are there. How can we hinge on existing networks? Because as our project, it's, we're quite small. But if you hinge on existing networks, then we can um, engage in that kind of conversation. Sorry, I, I just... Um, Good. Decided thank to you. take all that I had on my <laughs> yeah. wonderful. No, thank you very much. So I will still answer on the question of Tina. And Tina, it's really a very good thought. And I must say it the almost the same thought, not exactly, also came to my mind. We didn't plan it beforehand, but just uh, a week ago I thought, wow, shall we not also include the feature that pastoralists can give feedback on the work that NGOs do in the area? Because there are a lot of NGOs and they do a lot of crazy things. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, this could also be extended to governmental organizations, not only non-governmental organizations. Usually, governmental organizations are completely absent. So, um, that uh, therefore, maybe they have also not come to my mind. But that's... Um, what is indeed a, a good opportunity also, so that they can also point to issues that they want to be seen uh, by others. Yeah, indeed. Mm -hmm. cool. So you have a couple of words for Tan's question on the representativeness of the <gasps> yes, data. Yes, thank you very much. So at the moment, uh, we have in, in this project not yet started with the tracking. Yeah. This is what I have been showing, is the pilots that we have been yeah. doing before. But we ha have now uh, purchased uh, 30 um, smartphones, I think in Kenya, and 30 in um, Namibia. And the app contains a feature that the herd movement is then um, tracked based on the smartphone. And later on, on all smartphones that use the app, if the uh, user wants that. Yeah? They have, of course, to say we want it, give their okay, otherwise it's not tracked, that's clear. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, so at yeah. the moment... On that, actually, yes. Good, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem Who's with two speakers. Talking to somebody else, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's finish, Brigitte. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll just no, say what no I wanted problem. to say. Just, just so, um, therefore, I want to say at, at the moment, for us, there is also no um, problem of being representative or not. But indeed, the uh, idea is that many users will actually be tracked. And we are not going to show this data instantly. So we are not, we will not, the app will not show this uh, directly where they are. This would be much too dangerous. This would only be shown after either two or four weeks so that one can see which parts of the area have been used and by who, how many. Yeah? And this would definitely also help in the discussions then again with the governance level to show actually, look, you were thinking this area is not used, but we can prove that this area is used. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Is there any burning, burning, burning question still on somebody's lips? If not, I want to. If not, I want to mention also with regard to the community involvement because I mean, in our transdisciplinary project, we are really going a hard way to institutionalize the partnership and I hope all of you have been reading the blog that has been written by Dr. Margareta Lilea on this involvement. Just want to make some publicity. Some advertisement. Excellent. Very good. Good. And any of you who haven't been on the website, please do go there. You can also find the recordings of the previous uh, Colloquia recordings there. One thing I would actually like to add, I'm, I'm now sort of wrapping up a little bit and, and listening to the two of you. Um, I was reminded of a, an assignment that I once did in the Pacific Islands when I was looking and working with communities on uh, the legal framework of um, 
of dealing with indigenous knowledge. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that you are also dealing with, especially, you know, as you talk about the no knowledge of particularly good pasture grounds and things like that, and how important it is to keep uh, a sensitivity to the ownership of the data, you know, that the data is going into a kind of a black box uh, with, with, the, with the InfoRange project, and, and they heard us trust you enormously uh, with the knowledge that they share, and, and, and just... Um, uh, I, I find it super how you deal with that, and you know that you have this sensitivity in in uh, in keeping the information with the herders, uh, and they they are the ones that decide on how much they actually want to uh, to give give out and uh, for the benefit of others as well. So that's that's super. And the other thing, the other point, uh, Hussein, you mentioned the uh, the use of uh, of new green energy. Uh, the multi-layer, like, like agri uh, photovoltaic uh, areas or something like that, which is quite interesting because we have more and more of those in Germany as well, uh, especially also uh, for rain, rangeland, we don't have rangeland, but grazing land uh, areas, and, and there's increased interest also in developing these kinds of multi-story systems in, in, in various forms, so it rings, it rings uh, a bell. Again, thank you very much, uh, the two of you, for a very interesting presentation. Thank you for all of the discussants uh, for their interesting questions and contributions, and everybody for their patience. Note that our next colloquium will be not in four, but in three weeks time, 6th of June, uh, and Tan and Andreas Burkhardt from the Declaré project will develop that. Contribution. So Andreas uh, promised a, a presentation talking about the Declaré progress, and uh, I will be back to you with more information on that. Cool. Have a nice afternoon, evening, uh, and see you next time.